Hidden deep in the waters of a tropical paradise, a team of wreck divers explore the remains of a mighty Japanese naval base from World War II. In February 1944, American forces launched a surprise attack against the Truk Islands, one of the most important Japanese strongholds in the South Pacific. Now, divers travel halfway around the world to investigate these ghostly relics of the Japanese military machine. But the war might not be over in this blue lagoon. Live torpedoes, bombs, and ammunition still fill these rusted decks of twisted steel. One wrong move, and these divers could become the final victims of World War II. New Jersey is half a world away from the islands of the South Pacific. You gonna want to take this with you, Ben? Yeah, yeah. But it's where wreck divers Dan Kroll, David Uloa, and Becky Kagan's journey into the past begins. This is ready to go? Yeah. In Dan's garage, amid a sea of dive gear, the team gathers specialized equipment that will keep them alive where humans don't usually go. Their destination is Truk, a small chain of islands in the South Pacific, 1,500 miles northwest of Australia. The journey takes Dan, David, and Becky on a whirlwind tour, first flying over the Pacific to Japan, then waiting hours to change planes and head southeast to Truk. The grueling trip takes over two days, taking its toll even before the divers hit the water. Well, here we are. We finally made it after about 20 hours of travel and a uh, 10-hour layover in Guam. After 30-some hours of travel to get to truck, and the first morning I woke up, I sat up in bed, and I said, where am I? What country am I in? I, I literally, I just couldn't remember. And then I realized I was in truck, and I was very happy. Truk was one of Japan's most important military bases, a supply depot where planes, tanks, and vital war materials were easily shipped throughout the empire. In February 1944, a surprise American attack was launched against Truk, a battle that became known as Pearl Harbor's Revenge. For two days, Wave after wave of American aircraft delivered a crippling blow to the islands. Their bombs destroyed over 200,000 tons of ships and nearly wiped out this military base. While the headlines of Midway and Guadalcanal are easily found in the history books, the Battle of Truk is often left behind. Island paradise. Now, the mission of Dan, David, and Becky is to head beneath the waves and shine a light on this crucial but little-known turning point of World War II. Over five days, the divers will explore four Japanese ships and two airplanes scattered among the islands of Truk. What awaits them are rarely seen images from World War II cargo ships full of bulldozers that paved roads and airstrips, gas masks worn by men in the heat of battle, beer bottles that celebrated the end of a patrol. The dive team will document a behind the scenes of war, a glimpse at the people and material that built the Japanese empire. Summer, 1943. The American Navy, shattered on December 7, 1941, has been rebuilt. 
Allied commanders launch a counteroffensive island hopping campaign to strike the Japanese. The idea is to capture key islands one after another until Japan itself comes within range of American bombers. In November 1943, the Americans take control of the Gilbert Islands, followed by the Marshall Islands. By January 1944, naval commanders are within reach of Truk, the Japanese super fortress of the South Pacific. The islands encircle a deep lagoon and are surrounded by a nearly impenetrable barrier reef. Rising through the clouds, high mountains help to provide cover from air attacks. During World War II, the Japanese craft these natural defenses into the ultimate naval and air base. If the Americans are going to take complete control of the Pacific, truck must fall. Well, according to the little drawing here, you've got this John Deere tractors and there's... Now, wreck divers Dan Kroll, David Uloa, and Becky Kagan are getting ready to explore the jagged wreckage. Their mission, to bring back unusual, rarely seen images of World War II. At first glance, the trucks, gas masks, and war equipment of these wrecks might appear to be mundane relics. But to the dive team, these are the building blocks of the Japanese war machine, an insight into the creation of an empire. The first ship the divers come to is the Hokai Maru, one of the many cargo ships and truck that ferried the raw materials of war. This is what the Hokie model looks like farther back. The, the bow is out in front, which is all splayed out on the bottom in the middle here, and the uh, forward holes exploded. They were full of barrels of aviation gasoline. This dive is an underwater parking garage. It was basically being a, a, a floating storage facility. We'll come down here, we'll get set up, uh, and David and I will take off forward once we see that you're, uh, that you're coming down the line try to capture some of this damage here and possibly uh, run along here and uh, then we're going to go down into this cargo hold and, and, and see what we can find. The Hokai Maru is submerged in about 150 feet of water at the bottom of Truck Lagoon. This cargo ship was built in New Zealand in 1921, but 20 years later she became the Hokai Maru after she was captured by Japanese merchant raiders and transformed into a transport ship. For three years, the Hokai Maru ferried war material among the islands of the empire. Then, in late January 1944, she left Japan with coal, supplies, and personnel for truck. The Hokai Maru, great dive. The dive conditions here are just you know, phenomenal. You couldn't ask for, for better conditions. We went and checked out the stern cargo hold. I was expecting to see something else, but what we found were bulldozers, and we found trucks, and we found tractors. So it was really mostly building material, building tools that we found on the Hokai Maru. When I think war, I think things like, you know, the bombs and the torpedoes. Uh, I didn't think about things like farm equipment. So to be down inside of these cargo holds and to be on top of something like a tractor, uh, and then to realize the human element of it, that people were there to build roads and runways to bring in more materials and is a staging area. It was another aspect that I didn't uh, think of before. Navy brass realized that truck maintains Japan's infrastructure in the South Pacific the base would have to be eliminated. In January 1944, Operation Hailstone was organized to do just that. The plan is simple. A two-day attack designed to take the Japanese completely by surprise. Several daylight and nighttime airstrikes would bomb Japanese aircraft and ships in and around the lagoon. Meanwhile, a force of U.S. ships and submarines would guard possible exit routes, decimating any Japanese that tried to escape. 
But naval commanders admit that the attack will be a plunge into the unknown. Vital facts about truck are missing. How many battleships are stationed in the lagoon? How many Japanese Zeros are fueled and ready to defend the skies? On February 4, 1944, two PB-4Y planes fly a reconnaissance mission to find answers. Armed with cameras, they gather intelligence about the Japanese defenses on Trucks Islands. The film the pilots bring back confirms that Truck is no ordinary military base. Several warships are clearly seen in the lagoon, as well as hundreds of aircraft and a huge contingency of tanker and transport ships. But the real prize was the sighting of the super battleship Musashi, one of two flagships in the Japanese fleet. If the Americans could take down this command vessel, it would be a stunning blow to the Japanese. A day of reckoning is planned. The American attack would strike truck on a scale even more powerful than the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. Now, more than 60 years later, recent innovations will dramatically increase the ability of these divers to explore the shipwrecks in Truck Lagoon. It's a lot of equipment. Be wearing all this at once. Technology has always been the key to surviving the dangers of deep water diving. Traditionally, divers breathe compressed air or mixed gases through a regulator attached to a tank in a system called open circuit diving. After the air is inhaled in the lungs, the body exhales carbon dioxide as well as oxygen. The carbon dioxide and oxygen are then released as bubbles out into the water. But what if the oxygen in those bubbles could be reused by the divers? Becky still uses an open circuit system. But Dan and David are trained on a technology called rebreathers, a system that has become popular among divers in the past 10 years. The basic principle of a rebreather is that it reclaims the gas that you exhale and recycles it. It uh, cleans out the carbon dioxide that our bodies need to get rid of, then it replenishes the oxygen that we metabolize. And in doing that, it just does it in a loop and constantly recycles the gas. The exhaled carbon dioxide is forced through a chemical scrubber and removed, but the oxygen is still available for rebreathing. So in back, there's a little computer. Uh, oxygen is added, air is added when it's needed. It just blends it all together, and I get to breathe some of the best air I can breathe at whatever depth I'm at. This is very similar to uh, what astronauts might use in outer space. Using rebreather technology doesn't come without risks. It also requires extensive training. Digital readouts on high-tech computers calculate the proper oxygen mixtures. Constant monitoring is essential when diving. A wrong gas mixture 200 feet below could result in an instant tragedy. Rebreather technology has hardly become a standard in the dive community. For the same amount of time in the water on a rebreather, you would need nearly 10 times the amount of gas to do that on open circuit. But high-tech equipment can protect a diver from old-tech explosions. Eclipsed by other clashes in the Pacific, the Battle of Truck was, in fact, a turning point in World War II. For two days, the Americans barraged the Japanese with a hail of firepower never seen before. Their mission is to show a rare behind-the-scenes sight of World War II, the infrastructure of the Japanese war machine. February 17, 1944. Morning breaks as a group of Hellcats and Avengers speed down an aircraft carrier runway and lift off into the unknown. Operation Hailstone begins. In a mere two hours, the Americans establish complete control of the air, clearing the skies of enemy planes. But unlike the Pearl Harbor attack, 
the Japanese know the Americans are coming. The plane sent to scout truck two weeks earlier had been spotted. Many of the battleships and destroyers previously anchored at truck have vanished, including the super battleship Musashi. To sink the Musashi would have been the ultimate coup. The Musashi and her sister ship, the Yamato, were built in the mid-1930s when battleships were the ultimate weapons in naval warfare. In their time, they were the ocean's behemoths. Each ship was nearly 900 feet long from bow to stern and 130 feet wide. And big ships also meant big guns. The Yamato and the Musashi carried 460 millimeter main armament cannons, the largest guns ever put on a battleship. It took 45 seconds to reload the 18.1 inch shells, which weighed nearly 3,500 pounds and could be fired at targets nearly 25 miles away. The curvature of the earth only allows a ship to see within 15 miles to the horizon so airplanes had to guide these massive guns to their targets. Despite their size and strength, these super battleships were never as effective as the Japanese had hoped. Both were sunk by overwhelming air power, but not at truck. Although the Musashi escaped before the American attacks at truck, Beneath the waves, evidence of her super size and power still remain. The team discovers it in the dark compartments of the next ship, the Yamagiri Maru. The ship held cargo meant for the Musashi. These huge 18.1 inch armor piercing shells were made for her massive guns. Incredibly, it appears that none of these giant shells exploded when the Yamagiri Maru went down. If one had, the resulting chain reaction of exploding shells would have shattered the ship into pieces. The Yamagiri Maru also holds grim reminders of the men on the front lines during this war. Within the interior of the ship is a site that attests to the sheer power of Operation Hailstone. We go into the engine room uh, as we make our way back, wind and weave our way through the different pieces of machinery and, and diesel motors, the guide points his light at something, and, and I point the big video light to see what that is. And it's this, it's a skull. It's a, it's a skull of a Japanese sailor who, who this is where he made his last stand. Uh, his head's now embedded into the, into the wall, and uh, it was just, it, it presented an eeriness. And, and what made it even more eerie is this little dim light that the dive guide was putting on there. Um, I, had, I had to take the big bright light away because it was just so spooky looking to see it like this. The divers can't help but respect any sailor who stood his post, even if he fought for the enemy. After I got over that initial visual thing, then it hit me as this is, this is a man's grave. This is a place where, where a man took his last breath and, and uh, he had a family that thinks, of, you know, the whole thing that, that goes along with that. Uh, as a sailor, I can feel for how this man um, spent his last day. But uh, that, that made it a very unique and interesting dive as it was probably the first, it was the first set of remains that I had ever come across on a ship. The, his bones are laying in a pile just below where the skull is. Now, you, you know, you go in there and you see something like that, you can only imagine that you wonder how many years that this entire skeleton was maybe just dangling there. When you go inside a shipwreck and you see remains, that really says this, this, this is what happened and people, people died in these conflicts. The Yamagiri Maru isn't the only wreck with dangerous cargo. The dive team moves on to the Hian Maru, one of the ships caught in the crossfire of Operation Hailstone. Before the war, she was a passenger ship but in 1941, the Japanese Navy requisitioned and transformed her into a supply ship called a subtender. Subtenders were vital to the war effort, bringing food, fuel, torpedoes, and other equipment to Japanese submarines around the Pacific. 
Diving down on the Hia and Maru was really exciting and special for me in a couple of ways. One, as a submariner, I had seen and been, you know, I'd been on these, uh, these, these tenders, these submarine tenders in the past, the U.S. version, uh, modern versions. But to be down on a Japanese tender, this was really exciting. For one, is this was an old cruise ship that was converted over into a, into a tender. So it wasn't really what I expected. The Hien Maru sits in 110 feet of water, not deep by the dive team standards. What makes this dive so treacherous are the twists and turns of navigating through a cargo ship laying on its side. It's kind of like taking your house, turning it up on edge, and then being able to navigate from one room to the next. Sometimes there's a door on the ceiling or a door's on the wall, but the, but the door's gonna be sideways rather than perpendicular. You know, you have to navigate through this area by looking at it on its side. As Dan, David, and Becky navigate down into the belly of the beast, they come face to face with the real terror of World War II. Torpedoes meant for Japanese submarines still fill the decks of this ship. One wrong move could set off a devastating explosion that would end the dive before it begins. So as we head aft and we go through a door horizontally, we go into another room and there's torpedoes lying all over the place. But they're actually not lying. They're actually standing on edge because uh, when they were loaded into the ship, they were loaded lying down and now the ship's on its side so now they're standing up. While we were diving the Hia and Maru, I had absolutely no lights on my video camera so I was really relying on Dan's lights, on his video camera and Dave's 150 watt HID. So we're three decks into this ship and I see Dave just scan his light across this cargo hold and light up all of these torpedoes. Now I'd never seen a torpedo before so I never realized uh, the size of them. And it was just incredible to see not just one, not two, but just tons of them just scattered across this, this cargo hold. The other thing that, that was unique or exciting for me when I got down there is I'm looking at these periscopes. I mean, these things are long tubes. I say two periscopes because there was two different kinds of periscopes. There was an attack periscope, and then there was your standard optical periscope, you know, which had zoom lenses and all whatever they had in it. But the attack periscope was smaller, thinner, and we got some great shots of that where you can see the actual differences in size. The attack periscope, it presented a lower profile as it cut through the water and created less of a wake. It gave them a little bit more uh, concealment as they were eyeing on their targets. Wreck penetration is one of the most dangerous propositions facing a diver. Shards of twisted metal can reach out to rip open a dive suit or cut an airline. Lethal torpedoes and bombs can detonate at the slightest touch. All of these factors require the divers to carefully consider every last detail when entering the wrecks of Truck Lagoon. Entering a wreck is always a fun thing to do, but it poses some dangers and some considerations need to be met. So before I personally enter a wreck, one of the big things going through my mind is I want to get out. I need to find always a way out. These ships have been on the bottom of the ocean for over 60 years and what were once mighty war machines have deteriorated and become unstable. Even the gentle swish of a fin can stir up a blinding dirt and debris storm. Getting lost on a wreck means using up precious air. If a diver gets disoriented while inside the wreck, the results can be deadly. So you want to be really careful not to kick up silt or at least kick up as little silt as possible. And inside a wreck, that's all there is. Everything is coated and coated in inches and inches of silt. So it's very important to maintain a buoyancy. Buoyancy is where you're not floating up and you're not sinking. There's a few dangers that we're always aware of every time we enter a wreck. Some are very obvious. You know, there's fishing line, there's nets, there's entanglements, there's wires and equipment. As we enter it, the, these, these pieces of, of material present uh, uh, these pieces of material present obstructions and hazards that, that we as divers can get entangled on and stuck. Now we have a, even though we're using rebreathers and big tanks, uh, we do have a finite amount of time we can stay underwater. And if we're not able to free ourselves or our buddy 
uh, and our team isn't able to help us get out, uh, that, that can be a big problem. Only divers with years of training should attempt a wreck penetration, especially when they're shooting with a camera. I'm shooting Dan and Dave as they're shooting these torpedoes, and they turn around to, to look at me, and they, they shine their light up above my head, and above me, just dangling on some, some electrical cords or some kind of wires, is one of these huge torpedoes, just literally right above my head. I didn't even know it was there. The bubbles Becky produced could have had disastrous results. Well, in a situation like that, since I am on open circuit scuba, not on a rebreather, and I, I have bubbles uh, coming out, those bubbles could dislodge, you know, not only debris or things from the ceiling, but it could have knocked that torpedo free or loose, and it could have it could have come down. And that is a definite danger of wreck diving, and not only wreck diving, but using open circuit scuba uh, when you're when you're in an environment like this. For me, the thrill is really not, um, you know, the dangers, but capturing images that, uh, you know, your average person may not be able to get to. So it's sharing those images with other people. Now, the dive team heads below the waves, not to see ships, but airplanes. In February 1944, as the Americans unleash Operation Hailstone, Navy pilots prepare for a colossal dogfight with nearly 400 Japanese planes scouted two weeks earlier. But this mighty show of Japanese air power is an illusion. When American planes attack, only a handful of enemy planes actually fight back. Although the Japanese know the attack is coming, they aren't expecting it so soon. Their pilots are scattered among the various islands. Some planes are simply waiting for repairs. The lack of manpower leaves many Japanese planes on the ground. By the end of the Hailstone Raid, less than 100 of the Japanese planes remain, and many of these are severely damaged. The waters of Truck Lagoon are now a graveyard for this once vaunted Air Force. Among the wrecks is the Mitsubishi G4M attack bomber. The Japanese unofficially called it the Hamaki, which means cigar for the airplane's long cigar-shaped fuselage. The Allies nicknamed it the Betty Bomber in the tradition of naming bombers after females and fighters after males. The Betty was the workhorse of the air fleet, and more of them were built than any other Japanese bomber. The plane's twin rotary engines pulled 1,825 horsepower, achieving speeds close to 300 miles per hour. The Betty was designed with one purpose in mind, covering long distances. The bomber could fly between two and 3,000 miles while carrying a payload of over 2,000 pounds, an astounding feat for the time. But flying such great distances meant sacrifices had to be made. Long range bombers need to be light and to keep their weight down, the airplane's defensive armor was virtually non-existent. The Betty was extremely vulnerable to machine gun and cannon fire from Allied fighters, especially around the wings, which doubled as fuel tanks. In fact, the bomber was so prone to ignite when under attack that Allied pilots often called it the flying lighter. 50 feet beneath the waves sits one of the more than 2,400 Betty bombers that were built by the Japanese. Through the misty waters, the team spies the telltale cigar shape for which Japanese pilots famously nicknamed her. Up close, the bomber is surprisingly intact, despite over 60 years at the bottom of the lagoon. I mean, it's just, it, it looks like you could pull it out, put the engines back in place, get the radio off the sand, and you could get it back in the air. 
I was amazed at how intact it is for, for being an aircraft and that, that crash landed in the water. The other thing that struck me about diving in this aircraft is, is its size. Um, I, I had a moment where I watched, I peeked in one of the gun windows and I watched Dan swim through the wreck, through this aircraft, and his body, he filled the entire aircraft. And I'm like, I'm thinking, this used to carry bombs, people, machine guns. This lagoon was a stepping stone in the middle of the Pacific, and it was used as a hub for the, the planes to refuel, uh, the planes to reload, and the planes to go out and uh, come back from and do island hopping or just to do patrols. But the team is not the first to dive the site. They discover the plane is missing its guns. Over the years, many people have been down here diving this thing. It's in relatively shallow water. And off to the side, there's actually a lot of little parts, uh, radio and other pieces that people have taken out and light on the sand over there. So the guns may have very well been removed and uh, taken home as artifacts. It was just very impressive as to how intact it was after being down there, sitting on the ocean's floor for 63 years. In front of the plane, where it had hit the water, I guess, and the engines had, had blown off in front of it, maybe it's 100 or 200 feet. So we went and we checked out the engines and the propellers and then made our way back to, uh, to the Betty bomber. This Betty isn't the only airplane lying at the bottom of Truck Lagoon. In fact, perhaps the most famous icon of World War II aviation is there as well, the Japanese Zero. The Japanese Zero was a deadly weapon, greatly feared by Allied pilots. Capable of quick maneuverability and incredible endurance, this sleek airplane operated like a well-trained prize fighter. The plane could cover between one and 2,000 miles while reaching speeds of over 300 miles per hour. Two 7.7 millimeter machine guns and two wing cannons pounded enemies with bursts of deadly firepower. Made of aluminum, it was much lighter than American planes, weighing just 10,000 pounds fully loaded with pilot fuel and ammunition. Today, the dive team finds the remains of a Zero deep within the bowels of the Fujikawa Maru, another passenger ship seized by the Japanese military. In 1940, the Fujikawa Maru was transformed into an aircraft ferry, carrying planes and parts to different bases around the empire. But Operation Hailstone would be the death knell for the transport ship. Just one aerial torpedo into the side of the ship was needed to bring her down. The explosion ripped through deck upon deck of the freighter. And now that evidence can be seen 110 feet below. After making their way through what was left of the Fujikawa Maru, Dan, Becky, and David finally encounter what many consider to be the finest aircraft of its time. I dropped into one cargo hold and there were three of these zeros in there. And so I was in there uh, actually by myself photographing these planes uh, since I had a still camera with me. And it was amazing just to see that all the instruments were still intact, you know, all the little pressure gauges and that some of the flaps and the wings would still work. This terror of the sky was not a perfect plane. Much like the Betty bomber, the zero was totally unprotected by armor plating and the fuel tanks were thin and light. The Zero was delicate, and it didn't take too much to bring down. By 1943, the Americans responded with the Grumman F6F Hellcat, which was a fast, well-armored fighter and immediately outclassed the Zero. The Hellcat proved to be the most successful aircraft in naval history destroying 5,163 enemy aircraft during World War II. February 1944, the American airstrikes of Operation Hailstone continue at two hour intervals for nearly two straight days, turning a tropical paradise into a living hell. But by the afternoon of February 18th, the raging fires and thick smoke surrounding truck begin to dissipate. 
One of the ships sent to the bottom of the lagoon was a freighter with an unlikely name, the San Francisco Maru. 22 years before the war between Japan and the United States began, she was named for that city by the bay. The extreme depth of 210 feet makes the wreck accessible only to the most experienced divers, but a favorite for those willing to take the risk to visit this impressive site. I had a lot of fun diving on the San Francisco Maru because for one, it's a deep dive. I really, that's, that's where I really get excited is deep dive. So we're over 200 feet deep on this wreck. And I'm actually happy that it was the last dive because I felt like every other dive we did was leading up to this, this wreck. Now this one, you drop down and the first thing that comes into view out of the shadows is one of these big deck guns with these spent shells underneath. The wreck is a true testament to the firepower that the Japanese intended to spread throughout the empire. For divers, the San Francisco Maru's biggest thrills are found in the Japanese Type 95 Hago light tanks on her deck and the ammunition in her forward holds. The Hago was a workhorse for the Japanese army. Its miniature size and firepower were insufficient to take on full-size tanks but it was effective against infantry who weren't equipped to handle tanks at all. This was tiny and a little gun, a little turret, and I'm thinking, you know, you could fit two or three people in here, but, uh, but this was indicative of the type of tank, uh, you know, that used in battle at, th at this time, as period in time, World War II, this is the type of tank. But it never struck me as to how small these tanks actually were. Looked like the whole wreck just went from the surface right down to the sea floor, and the tanks are still sitting there ready for battle. The dive plan was, let's gonna go explore these cargo holds to see what's in there and, and get some good video of whatever we've got. Now we have ideas of what we're gonna see. Uh, I've been told there's munitions, there's mines, there's this, there's that, and the cargo holds are full. And you really don't get a sense until you actually see it. I drop down through the, through the slats of one cargo hold, and I light up this ammunition all around me, mines. And I'm looking at just hundreds of, everywhere I go, there's another mine. And I just don't want to see anything wiggle. I don't want to see anything move. I don't want to kick anything, you know? It's like, is this going to stay together? This has been, this is ordinance from 50 years or 60 years ago. And it's been corroding by salt water. What's to say, you know? And anyway, those thoughts enter your mind. The dive team came to truck in search of the sheer industrial might of Japan. Over 200 feet beneath the waves, they found the ships that enabled an island nation to become a world power. And that's more what I expected to see. Big tanks, deck gun, bombs. Wow. I think that's what we were looking for here. American pilots flew 1,250 sorties during the two-day attack disabling much of the Japanese war machine here. In the end, American casualties were relatively low. 25 aircraft were lost, and 29 men were killed in action. But it was a far different story for the Japanese. Nearly 250 aircraft and 45 ships had gone down in the raid. In all, over 200,000 tons of Japanese ships were sunk and hundreds of lives were lost. The Americans did not occupy truck after Operation Hailstone. Instead, they moved on to attack other islands, but this crippling blow reverberated throughout the Japanese command. They were forced to acknowledge to the Japanese public that the Americans were gaining ground in the war. The mainland could soon be under threat. Now, this dive team has rediscovered truck's strategic importance. To me, truck would be like any other island in the Pacific if it wasn't for all of the history that lies beneath its waters. Uh, to dive down and literally like go back in time and see things like gas masks and planes, uh, bulldozers, tanks, trucks, these things all really pull it together for me that this wasn't only a piece of World War II, but also the, the people that were there and needed to have these things to help build this empire. 
you're looking at all these other materials, you're looking at torpedoes uh, that uh, look like somebody stacked them in the side of the garage somewhere, um, and you're looking at uh, planes that are just littered all over the bottom there. So seeing all this in one place, it was like, I'm used to seeing all the machines of war that destroy. This was all building equipment. There was trucks and uh, you know things for building, things for creation. There was a lot of it. There was just a ton of it down there. But I think what they were trying to do was they were ready to take over that part of the Pacific, that part of the world, maybe the entire world. But they would never get the chance. 17 months later, on August 15th, 1945, the Japanese would surrender. Midway, Iwo Jima, and Okinawa may be the more famous battles in the history books, but Truck stands as one of the most successful and strategically important U.S. engagements in the South Pacific.